Here we go, one more time. Integrity, leverage, curiosity, generosity. That's what it means to me to be a man with a plan, a man who'll take a stand, a man who'll lead the band. I know what my core values are, inspired by the cardinal virtues, stoic philosophies, feel as natural as the birds and the bees. That's why I'm always climbing new trees, aiming for the top where I'll be feeling the breeze, consistent even when I'm weak at the knees. God, I'm begging you, please, let me try and flip a moments like these. There you go. <laughs> It, all it took was just the yeah, camera being all, on. All I needed was a mic. <laughs> um, that was sick, dude. That was a sick intro. Yeah, I'm gonna leave that in too. Oh, yeah, no, you're not. <laughs> I just hope you know that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, Lucas, welcome. Uh, it's good to have you on the Voice of Production. You're a good friend of mine, and I'm really happy to have you. Hey, so, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, welcome, welcome. So. Um, we have known each other for, I think it's almost a year now, uh, maybe, maybe a little less than a year. No, oh, right around a year. Yeah, but I filmed a podcast with you and Derek, who we'll be talking about later on in this uh, episode, but I filmed a podcast with you and Derek, and I was fascinated because you knew a lot about AI, and it was so new, especially like a year ago, for you to know that much about it, and it really like kind of opened me up to a lot of things and a lot of ideas. And I was like, well, like maybe I'll check this guy out. And so I went on, you know, the internet, looked you up and uh, looked at your like uh, use cases for AI. And like you had a whole website, very detailed. I'm like, wow, like I need to talk to this guy. And, you know, I got to know you and I feel like this is like a perfect opportunity to have you on because of this new challenge that you're doing. So, um, yeah, man, why don't you just start with like your background and let people know who you are, the AI daddy, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. For any of you that don't know, online, I go by AI daddy. And that all started from me wanting to learn about artificial intelligence as quickly as possible. And just realizing the way we learn things, you know, I could read, I could listen, I could study content. All that mattered at the end of the day was teaching people, having to speak about the things that you're learning, the things that you're passionate about, and teaching it and explaining it makes such an incredible difference when trying to master something. And I had gone to TikTok because I knew that none of my friends had TikTok. Yeah. And I didn't want them to see me doing something embarrassing right? Talking about something that I was passionate about. It sounds silly in retrospect, but I went to TikTok ironically to hide from the people that I knew. And I started explaining and making little videos, teaching what I was learning about artificial intelligence. This was around two years ago. I, within a week, <laughs> actually, got 10,000 followers. Hmm. Within two weeks, I had 20,000 followers. The growth was incredible. And all I was doing was letting people know, hey, I'm not an expert. Like I never called myself an expert into this day. I still don't call myself an expert because if you're deep enough into artificial intelligence or any new technology, you very quickly learn it's, you can't keep up with it. It's constantly <laughs> changing, dude. It's yeah. constant. Like even a year ago when I was listening to you on that podcast, I'm like, dang, like this is crazy. And now if I look back at that, I'm sure I'd be like, wow, so much has changed since then. But yeah, yeah. you're right. It's constantly changing. It's a weird industry to be in, I feel like, right? It's, it's a hard industry to be in to keep up with. Yeah. So I've seen, back when I first started... I was originally an operations consultant, been doing operations for nine years. And then I made the jump to artificial intelligence because I saw the massive opportunity that was about to happen. It was right before OpenAI, ChatGPT came yeah. out. And that's part of what made that growth happen. Yeah, But being in it, 
you you can't keep up with it. Like the even the people who develop a lot of this technology, once their AI tools out in the wild, like they don't know what it's capable of. <laughs> yeah, uh, it snowballs very very quickly. Well, well, that's actually a good point because after TikTok, after you blew up on TikTok, big companies started to reach out to you, right? Yeah. Or it was you like your friends started talking, and then big companies. Yeah. So this all started with filming myself with my iPhone. That was it. Within a month, I had reached 50,000 followers on TikTok. Mm -hmm. The moment I hit that month, I started getting a bunch of AI startups asking me to promote their AI solution, their yeah. technology. Right. Over the last year, I've gotten to work with and promote over 200 AI tools. And that was part of what started my whole journey. I didn't know what it was going to look like going into AI at the very beginning. I just knew I had to say yes to every opportunity. Yeah. So I got to the point eventually where I even ended up working with Adobe to wow. promote Adobe Firefly and a lot yeah. of their tools that have come out. I gotten to work with and promote a lot of Fortune 500 companies' AI tools. Wow. Uh, Canva was one of them. It all happened from me just saying yes. Mm -hmm. And then from there, the momentum started picking up to where I finally understood enough of these tools that companies were starting to reach out and saying, hey, can you help us integrate this AI into our company. Yeah. And it snowballed once again, um, very quickly integrating into marketing departments, yeah. video editing. Well, I know because we use <laughs> yeah. AI in our company. You know, we use like the podcast editing softwares, you know, yeah. the, the captions and all that stuff. Like we played around ChatGPT even, you know, for like scripts and like giving us an outline. And it really helps. But yeah that there becomes like a point where, you know, you've been integrating AI for a while and then you start to see, um, you know, companies hit this wall. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The, the thing I noticed implementing AI and dozens of companies was people are terrified of artificial intelligence. <laughs> that like literally there's only the people who are excited for this new technology and the people who are terrified. And the people who are terrified are 80% of the workforce. Yep. What I had experienced time and time again was a CEO, an executive at a company, coming to me and saying, hey, we want AI everywhere. And I'd go, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> I've learned. I've, I've been in the game quite a bit now. And I... I found myself spending more than half of my time having to educate their teams. That's where the not, wall Yeah, is, and not yeah. and not educate on how to use AI, but educate on their belief system about artificial intelligence. Yeah. I had so many people say, I'm not gonna use this technology because it's gonna take over my job. It's gonna take over the world. I would do surveys when I do public speaking and whenever I do these consulting gigs and I'd ask people, when you think of artificial intelligence, what comes to mind? Mm -hmm. The Terminator is what most people <laughs> say. The Terminator. It's a, it sounds like a joke, but that's what we've seen yeah. in the media. Yeah, that's right? what I think of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. And, and so I had to fight that belief system time and time again and it, it was inefficient I'd upgrade a company's processes to involve AI, whether it was through analyzing AI, like all your data sets on your yeah. customer, on their spending habits. There's so many different things you can do. On the creative side, you can have AI generate all your ideas, generate voices, generate video, generate yeah. images, generate music. Well, it's right? weird. Like I'm in the film industry and everyone who... Um, works with my team is just they're very afraid of it they hate it like I'm just like they tell me straight up I hate AI yeah and it's weird like trying to 
evolve with the times, but also like trying to educate them on, Hey, this isn't a bad thing necessarily. This could save us time and give us more time for other things that we should be focusing on. Right. Yeah. I mean, you could probably go more in depth to that point, but I, I always explain when I'm integrating AI into a company that your tech stack has levels to it. And the top level is your untouchables. The AI, like the Mm. tech that no matter what happens around you, you're not changing the fact that you use Gmail. You're not changing the fact that you use Microsoft or you use Adobe for your editing. Yeah. Or you use Canva, right? Like it's everyone knows that skill set and switching over from something as simple as Canva to Adobe the learning curve might not be that much now because they're all so similar, but the infrastructure of where you archive all your content, uh, all the work that you do, it's just not worth it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what you're experiencing and what you've seen your team go through is they don't want to start from zero again. They don't want to feel like beginners and that's, that happens to all of us. Like, literally, that's the hardest thing about being in the AI field. Yeah. Every day, I'm a beginner again. It's weird, dude, because I've been editing since I was eight years old. And as like I, I feel like editing was like my calling. And I, that's what I kind of grew up doing. I just love putting the story together. And now I'm seeing like all of these AI websites and like editing softwares coming out. I'm like, crap, like... I spent my whole damn life edit, or learning how to edit on Adobe Premiere Pro, and now there's like these softwares that can do all of it. And the and people will say it doesn't do it well. Sure, I'll I'll give you that. Like a lot of these tools, the editing or the image generation. Like, here's the thing: we are at the. This is the worst. This editing software. This music software, this art software, video software, voice software, we're at the worst it will ever be. Hmm. Why is that? Because the way artificial intelligence works is it learns and it's trained by every new input, every new video that you try to edit with it and that you say, I don't like this, do it again. Yeah. Uh, give me new ideas when you're talking to chat GPT and you're trying to generate your prompts or your scripts, whatever it might be, and you say, do it again, I don't like this. It learns. It learns. Yeah. And as you throw in all your media and everything, it's only going to get better. The best example I can give you is mid-journey. I imagine because a lot of your audience is creatives that they've heard about mid-journey. When mid-journey first came out, I mean, when... AI art first came out, yeah. the running joke was the hands and the fact that humans don't look like humans. And, you know, you'd ask it to generate you a picture of a salmon and it would show you like fillet slices <laughs> of salmon in yeah. an ocean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it was comically bad. Mm-hmm. But now you look at what mid journey is capable of now dude the photo realism yeah you can't tell that that's not a real human being and there was a new one that open ai came out with for video yep. which was freaky it came out with like a trailer have you seen that oh yeah it was like a trailer of i forgot even what it was but the humans it, they looked like real realistic humans doing something and the you could see the emotions on their face you know, it was actually like I was watching something. Now, there's still a little, a little bit where you can tell this is AI. But when you watch it, you're like, wow, we are close. We are so, very close. So they actually gave me uh, early beta access to that. Really? And when you try it out, like, of course, what you've seen is a highlight reel. It is the marketing of its capabilities. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that you'll struggle to get exactly what you want. But that's 
part of the learning curve. It's the prompt generation when you're trying to get Dolly or Mid Journey yeah. to like draw you a, a knight, I don't know, a princess, a, or storyboard, or a new product. It, you don't know the language to use to generate the things that you want. So I have a question then. So when this evolves and it gets very realistic, mm -hmm. will there be issues with copyright or do you think that people, because I always think like if I, if I create an AI movie, let's say, yeah. and it, I put it out to the world and it's a really good movie. It's very like engaging. People love to watch it, but also they know it was made by AI. Does that change anything? Will that change? Because if I just type in a prompt and they knew that the only time spent on creating this masterpiece was 30 minutes of creating a really good prompt and then that came out, do you think that takes away from the credibility of the video or the movie of the AI or do you think that people will still be able to enjoy it? There will always be people who say AI generated anything is an abomination that it is not right that they will take human design human works of art photography like video all this any day but when you look at the actual numbers when you look at the data mm -hmm. So I've helped quite a few different marketing departments integrate AI. Mm -hmm. And there was this one channel that they were a meme page. <laughs> and they had several different meme pages. They do have several different meme pages on Instagram that they run for finance firms, for different industries. And the like AI-generated memes... Mm -hmm. Two to three time, two to three times more engagement no than way. normal memes. Wow. Now let's dissect it a little bit. Memes are a safe place to use AI at the moment. Because a meme is a comical, over exaggerated, relatable, funny way to tell something truthful, right? right. To tell history yeah. in a certain way. And so the more over the top you can make it, the, the more of a dopamine hit people are going to get when they relate to that image and that visual combined with your, your quote. I would agree with that, yeah. So I've seen AI-generated images being used for memes perform better than anything out there. I think I know why. Well, I'm, I want yeah, you yeah, to no, say, I want to hear. but I want to guess first before you say, <laughs> but maybe because AI takes away the emotion of everything, right? And they can go over the top because they don't care about the repercussions of backlash from the media, right? You have to remember, AI is just a tool. Yeah. At the end of the day, it is not going to be able to do anything without a human being telling it to do that thing. So it's a human being that's generating those that's, memes. Yeah, that's true. That's generating those videos, that's generating that content. It's just a creative. Mm. And this is one of the biggest issues I've seen in most marketing departments. I've seen it quite a bit this past year where a, a head of a marketing department will say, hey, let's integrate AI into everything we're doing, and then they'll cut half their team. Yeah. But they don't realize that it, it requires people to connect with people, mm -hmm. right? Like everything we, the whole point of art is, is to speak, it's to communicate with people. Yeah. At a at a deeper level, at an intellectual level, at a philosophical level. We don't complain when a person uses a camera to take a picture. Yeah. Because true. we see it as an art form. That's right. Yeah. Right? Because there's a human behind it. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. Well, what I'm trying to say is like if I 
if I'm a person, like for, for a century, right, almost pretty much a century, maybe more, people have been making pictures, they've been making films, and it's always taken days, weeks, months, years to create films, like a full movie. Now it can take 30 minutes with AI. You know, it, well, not now, but, you know, as soon in the next year. Does that take away? Because people are so used to it for such a long time in history. People have been making movies like this. Now it's all of a sudden switched from a year making a film to 30 minutes from a prompt. Does that take away from the creative credibility? Do you consider it art when you turn on your phone and you just snap a pic? No. Some people do. Some people don't. It's subjective. But you said no. In what case would taking a picture be considered art to you? I guess I guess in some cases, like if you take out your phone and snap a picture, it could be considered art. Now I'm thinking of it. I'm just saying like I think of it as like art takes – I think in my eyes art takes courage. It, mm. it takes um, effort and courage and creativity and thinking outside of the box, like that's what I think of when I think of art. And when you're putting a prompt, that kind of takes away from all of that, right? Because so it, it kind of removes that courage for me. Because when you're when you're creating a new masterpiece, it takes, you know, you're like, ah, oh, do you know? You think of new ideas. Do I want to do this? Do I not? And if you do want to do it, you you commit to it. That takes yeah. courage to commit to a painting, to commit to a short film that you're going to create. When you have AI, there's no risk. You know, you're like, okay, I'll type in a prompt, see what comes up anyway. That doesn't, to me, that removes the courage. Hmm. So what you're saying is true art takes effort. It takes time. It takes thought. You know, most of the time, but I've also like, there's also been some masterpieces that have been created on accident. Yeah. You know. I go through this and I, I want to hear like what you have to say about art because it's so subjective. And I see everyone focusing on the time piece that you mentioned earlier. The fact that you can now make a movie or video, yeah. what took days, months, now takes minutes. Yeah. The real artists, the people who are going to be able to create works of art, like real art from leveraging AI, their time horizon, I don't see it being affected too much because the real incredible thing that I've seen with AI isn't the speed, it's the volume. It's the fact that you can now, you know, it took you 30 minutes to generate that one video. Mm. You can spend that month or that week or that entire day and generate hundreds of videos, hundreds of variations on your work piece until you refine it into the purest form of what you're trying to communicate, mm. what you're trying to achieve. And that's when I've seen some incredible next level artists on mid journey. That's when I've seen like the the meme pages that I was telling you about, yeah, they they do about fifty to a hundred AI generated memes before they choose which one to actually post. That's a good point, dude. Because their virality has a very simple formula that everyone tries to deny. Yeah, and it is content. It is volume. Yeah, it is just time in the industry, putting out videos, putting out posts, quotes, whatever you make day in and day out. One of my favorite books that I don't remember the name of, <laughs> I, I know it sounds, it sounds wrong, but it's a book that I came across at a li in a library uh, when I was in college okay. and I never checked it out. I just, I read it, I sat down and I read it all in one sitting. Wow. Was a book about history's greatest artists. Michelangelo, Beethoven, 
Leonardo, the, like Da Vinci, all yeah. the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, <laughs> <laughs> like all all these prolific artists, Picasso, all of them. It was trying to dissect and quantify what made them the best artists of their generation. Okay. And when they mapped out like the top 10 artists of like every era, their volume of music, of paintings, was about a hundred times more than people who were ranked below like the top five. Like it was astronomical wow. how much more they put out. Huh. And it was literally just that like Picasso, don't quote me on this, but I'm sure he had, I think around 400,000 paintings that he made. Wow. Like a couple hundred thousand. No one in his lifetime had like the second most prolific artist had like 15,000. Yeah. Like there was just no competing. And, you know, we know like maybe the blue arrow, like we know yeah. vague well, things like about Rodin. Picasso. Like Rodin, you know, he, have you, you know, Rodin, the artist, right? The sculptor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the great thinker. Yep. Yeah. I just went to Paris and his museum. I saw the actual great thinker uh, like a month ago, two months ago. And what was fascinating to me is how much, how many failures he had before the act. And it's going to your point, how many failures he had going to the actual sculpture, the final sculpture. And in his museum, they put out the failures, which is yeah. awesome because he, Rodin would be sculpting something and then he'd stop in the middle of it. And then he'd be sculpting something and he'd stop three quarters of the way through it and he'd throw it away. And then you'd see like, these different um, evolutions of how the sculpture, you know, failed and then how it evolved. And then you saw the final sculpture, which is how the whole museum was laid out and was beautiful to watch as an artist myself, because you see not just the finished product, but yeah. you see the amount of time that went into it. And that's yeah. why I, that's what I was talking yeah. about. And that's what people appreciate is the effort and the failures that go into it because people can relate to that because everyone has failures. Everyone, no one's perfect. And when people see, you know, the effed up sculptures, they can relate to it. That's what makes us human. I, yes. think, I think it really does come down to volume. Like you can't be good at something if you haven't failed. Like you can't be great at something if you haven't failed at it more than anyone else. Yeah. You look at it in sports, you look at it across, <laughs> like in sales, you look at it in any industry, any department, the people who had the most failures ended up becoming usually the greats. Well, like you failed, like, well, <laughs> I, should, <laughs> I, I started Ouch. that. You, you're a failure, <laughs> Lucas. <laughs> I am. Hey, yeah. I failed at plenty of things and that's what makes life Great. Yeah, like no, being you, able yeah. to go from one mistake to the other, not thinking of it as a mistake, but thinking of it as a lesson. Yeah. Well, I want to get into that because, you know, we just started talking about the TikTok and then you started realizing, well, there's something missing in the process, right? Yeah. So you want to talk about that? Yeah. I'll, I don't we, want to give yeah, it away. No, we, we I'll got let a you talk derailed. about this. <laughs> yeah, we got a little <laughs> derailed. Yeah. The fear that I was seeing when integrating this technology is because of all the layoffs that have been going on. Like mm -hmm. AI has played a very real part in all the layoffs yeah. we see in the media that are still going on. I had to change the way I was integrating AI into companies. And that's when you partnered with Derek, right? That's when I partnered with Derek from the Process Fixer. Yes. If you don't know the man <laughs> or what he's about, he is a legend here in the Valley in Phoenix, Arizona. Shout out Derek. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Derek. <laughs> he has this process triage methodology for mapping out businesses. Yep. Literally every step that you'd take for doing your work, right? Yeah. From idea generation 
to writing your script, to editing it, to getting it reviewed by the client, to them posting it, all that. Yeah. He, his methodology is really easy. And so me and him partnered up and I've figured out how to integrate AI into what he's doing and he's taught me this methodology. And now the way I come into companies is I'll do these process maps of your whole marketing department Mm -hmm. Or your whole sales team, like maybe it's order to ca- like yeah. having a lead all the way to getting paid. Yeah, we'll map all that out, and I'll map that out with your team. And then in a, not, find where not, you can not with the boss, not with the owner, who's usually who pays for these one day workshops that I now do. Yeah, I'll do it with the team, and yeah. I tell the the manager, the CEO, they're not allowed to be in the room mm. because we need the experts who are the actual employees, the people who do the work, who fight the plan. I love that. Yeah. We map it all out. And then I go, tell me the pain points. Tell me where it hurts. Tell me where it's a pain in the butt. But let's not make it about people. It's not about your manager. It's not about a teammate. Where does the process like hurt? Where's the, where are the bottlenecks? Where are things complicated and difficult I love that yeah. finding those pain points then it becomes so easy to successfully integrate AI, AI into a company yeah because now it's no longer you just ben, putting yeah it in. Ben Smith yeah. <laughs> uh, you know whoever telling me hey yep. and ha- help all my employees enhance them now it's all the employees all the workers saying this is what I do every day. This is my most challenging part of my entire day where I waste hours. Do you have a solution for me? Yeah. And all of a sudden, the technology that they integrate, it sticks. All of a sudden, they, they're not fighting it. It's calculated now. <laughs> it, it's, it's helping them. Yeah. And they're not in the mindset of, oh, this AI is going to take over my job. They're in the mindset of, this AI is going to save me hours of my day. Yes. that's what, And that's kind of what I was talking about earlier with my team, people who work for me. It's like they're afraid, but they're like, oh, it's going to take my job because they just see what the AI can do um, you know, on the screen or in an advertisement like with that movie, right? Yeah. But they don't know how it can help us. And by mapping everything out, I feel like that's really important for teams to know that. Yeah. Because you can literally physically see, and people who write down the process on a on a piece of paper, this is way different. This oh, is yeah. actually mapping it out so you can physically see it. Because you know, if you're uh, if you put in your GPS, right, how to get like you went, you came from home to here, right, or wherever you came from to the office, right, you didn't write a list of instructions how to get here, did you? <laughs> no, you put it in a map. Yeah, And that's how brains work. That's how human brains work. They work better looking at a map. And I think it's fascinating what you're doing. Um, and the reason I, I want to talk about this is because of your challenge, your 30-day mm-hmm. challenge, because it kind of goes back to the roots of this podcast, which is marketing and content creation. And what you've been doing with your 30-day challenge has really fascinated me, and it's the reason I reached out to you to come on this podcast. I knew I always wanted to do a podcast with you, but now this is like the perfect opportunity. So maybe explain to the viewers what you're doing with this challenge to help promote the workshop, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I made this shift in how I provided the service of implementing AI into companies. Mm -hmm. I instantly wanted to start selling this. I, I, f- I wrapped it up as a one-day workshop with a team where the deliverable is a 15 to 20 foot long physical map <laughs> and a digital map yeah. of your entire business. Yeah, a fo- literal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> followed with by a 90-day action plan because the thing that I also learned was sometimes a company isn't ready for AI. Sometimes you need to clean up your data. Sometimes you just have a broken process that doesn't work too well. You have an act, you're doing, you're in survival mode, right? You're going from getting paid to doing the work to getting paid to doing the work. And you never take the time to 
figure out your process, your system of how you deliver things to speed things up, automate them, whatever needs to get done. So I'll deliver these 90-day action plans that have nothing to do with AI. It's just this is what you can improve in your company. Yeah. And then I'll deliver a AI roadmap, a list of AI tool recommendations that overlays on top of that map where you can pinpoint, oh, exactly at this stage when when this lead comes in, yeah. I can have an AI automatically send an email or an AI voice agent having a physical, like a literal <laughs> conversation just to qualify the lead. There's so many things that can happen. Yeah. So those three deliverables, a map, a 90-day action plan, and an AI roadmap. I came up with it and I tested it a couple times and night and day. And that's when I realized I want to promote this. And I like I felt like I had just hit the lottery with building my own special niche yeah. for for AI implementation. So I decided I'm gonna do a 30-day challenge yeah. where I'm gonna try and make a hundred thousand dollars in 30 days using AI selling this one day workshop and also teaching and showing how I'm slowly integrating AI into my processes for this challenge. And you're currently, as we're having this podcast, you're on yeah. day 10? I'm on day 10 yeah. and I've made $10,000. I studied so many different challenges and being in TikTok, being on social media for over a year now, yeah. I'm always studying content. Mm -hmm. You have to give your audience a reason to come back. Absolutely. That's agree. why I love challenges. Mm -hmm. And the challenge can be about anything. I made mine big uh, and exciting with AI and a big dollar amount because I knew those would hook people in but that doesn't matter for a challenge. You can do a weight gain or well, I always loss. say there's you can do so I, I want to get back into that, but yeah. sorry to interrupt. But I always say there's three things that content has to be up. I also study content a lot. I mean, it's what I do yeah. right for a living. <laughs> but it has to be either shareable, it has to be interesting, or it has to be educational. Yeah. If you're watching this right now, I've never said this, I don't think, on the podcast, but it's what I say a lot to my clients is like those three things, shareable, interesting, or educational. If you can hit those three things, that's how you get results. Yeah. That That's how you give people a reason to watch your content, right? And that no, kind of that. ties into your 30-day challenge, right? Uh, I, I love that. I, I found that all that matters is remembering... You're not making the videos or the post for the sake of making art. Mm. You're not making it for the sake of going viral. You're not making it for the sake of getting likes. Love that. You yeah. are making it for a human being to consume, to experience, to see. You're absolutely right. And so out of all the 30-day challenges that I studied, the ones that went the most viral and actually had all the results that people wanted were the ones where in every day, some, the creator would go, you, the most voted or top voted comment is what I'm gonna do or try the next day. Love that. Adding polls, adding and giving a reason for people to engage in your content, night and day. And of course, responding to the comments. I went through maybe my first four to five months of creating content on TikTok, I was I I literally I still feel repulsed watching myself speak. Like <laughs> I don't like seeing my own yeah. content. I don't like listening to my own voice. Some people might do. I've never gotten used to it. Yeah. But because of that, I didn't even open up the comments. I didn't want to see my video. And so I wouldn't look at the comments for the first four to five months of me being out there, even though I had grown to a couple hundred thousand followers. Yeah. The moment I started ignoring my videos and going straight to the comments, everything changed. Yeah. Listen to your viewers. 
it's important. Yeah. yeah. For I, sure. When I didn't know what content to create next, I just had to look up yeah. <laughs> what people were asking for. Yeah, we just uh, we just had a, the last podcast before you was Lexi um, from Alecki Media, and she talked about how when Facebook first came out, people didn't know that it could be used as like um, like a testing a place to test your products and to test your services because that's a place where you can listen to your viewers, yeah. and it's free. That's oh, yeah. the crazy thing is back back in the day they had to pay to get their you know businesses had to pay to get their products tested. Yeah. They had to pay to get them, you know, in front of, you know, whatever. Now that Facebook came out back in like 2010 I think it was, you had all these people replying to you, replying to your videos, you're getting real feedback from real people. Yeah. And that's what you want. And that's how you can improve. And when you listen to them, that's how you can prove even more because now you know what they want. Right? Let me also say if your challenge, whatever you're going to do, like everything should be documented, whether you're trying to yeah. work out, whether you're trying to grow your business, whether you're trying mm-hmm. to make art. People want to see the behind matter. the scenes. Yeah. Do it and be human. Like I literally have been filming everything with my phone not editing anything other than just adding a caption. It's not because I don't know how to. I mean, I have actually a bunch of AI tools to do all sorts, to even translate it to other languages. Yeah. I focus on just making it as human as possible. The fact that I hold the phone when I'm recording it, it feels like we're having a, a FaceTime, a yeah. Zoom call. It feels like, authentic, it, yeah. It feels... Like we're connecting. Yeah. That's that's one important thing. The fact that there's no, like there's been this massive shift we've seen across most social media platforms where the short form content, making it feel more real and all the crazy Alex Hermosi style yep. captions and the hip hop music and it's everything. going away. I, I love it, but it's all going away because now it just feels like we're so bombarded with like stuff flying over so the screen much yeah <laughs> that that it's hard to stay stay engaged it's hard to actually connect with the person yeah. it's almost like distracting right yeah. to the actual message and the the funny thing is is all i've been really saying in my challenge is all the failures mm. all the hardships i haven't actually been like I said when I f- first made like my first five hundred dollars, because someone reached out and wanted wanted to do a quick little paid partnership, and I was saying yes to everything <laughs> to make sure I make like I reach the goal. Yeah. I I highlighted the positives, but what may what's made every video get more and more uh, traction is me just being authentic. Love that. Is me just saying, hey, I'm. I don't want to do this today. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I'm going to do it anyways. I'm going to figure it out. I tell, I tell it to <laughs> like my, you know, people who use uh, our services at fame all the time. They want, they feel like if they're high, especially for us, if they feel like they're spending a bunch of money hiring a professional video production company that they want their content to be manicured. They want it to be perfect, which yes, I agree with that. You know, storyboarding everything out and scripting everything is important. But at the end of the day, if you are authentic, and that's what I do as a director is teach people how to be authentic. It gives the viewer something to relate to. Because like you said, if you share your failures and if you share your wins, right? If you share everything, people can relate to that. Because again, nobody's perfect. There is 0% of people out there who are perfect. And if you show your failures, you're going to automatically relate to everyone because everyone else fails too, and it's normal. And as long as you're relatable, that's going to resonate. Perfection is a toxic excuse. It's the enemy of success, I feel like. I have big lights to make my videos look good. I have professional mics. I have professional cameras, tripods, all this. I spent a couple grand, <laughs> more than a couple grand, uh, 
continuously improving and buying all this equipment as I was blowing up on TikTok originally. Mm -hmm. And then I stopped making content because I, when I first hit like my first 100,000 followers, I felt like, oh, this is a responsibility now. Like yeah. I have to be professional. I have right. to, I have to be and look and sound and do all these things for it to be higher quality, mm -hmm. to grow faster, to. It's natural. It's oh, a natural thing. Yeah. I basically, well, this was in tandem with my consulting picking up. And so I went through this period where I, I used all the tech as an excuse. All like the fancy mics, the lights, every additional step that I had to do to start filming was just a uh, one more guarantee that I would never film a video. Mm. That's why I use a phone. That's why I think everyone should use a phone, especially now with AI generated content getting better and better and more and more viral. That's part of what's been pushing the trend towards the authentic, right? Just talking. There's not even like background music. Have you been There's... listening to this podcast, <laughs> Lucas? No, I've just been analyzing no. <laughs> things from the AI yeah. side of things. Like you're absolutely the, right. The more raw it is, the less excuses you have. And ironically, if you're doing it for a business purpose, the more successful you're going to be in business. I've found because People are doing business. They're going to do business with whoever they expect from, from what they see in your content. Hmm. If they see someone dressed casual, they're going to assume you're going to show up casual. If they see someone dressed professional, they're going to assume like that's who they're going to get, someone who's very... Yeah. You need to decide who, how you really want to show up in the world. Yeah. And then make the content based off of that mm -hmm. but just know that every new requirement that you add as a little kid you didn't want to be a professional <laughs> you didn't want to be uh all all these corporate layers that like we yeah. add now and that's those aren't the bosses we like admire or that we no. say are cool or genuine like the ones that we, the people we connect with are the people right. who care. Yeah. doesn't matter what they care about. That's right. You can geek out. I, it's one a, of the best conversations I've ever had in my life was with a janitor who literally thought of cleaning as a science. Mm. And it, it was just like breathtaking to yeah. like hear him speak. And, you know, he's not dressed. He's a janitor. Yeah, he's, he's, he's yeah. a freaking janitor. <laughs> One of, like to this day, one of the most memorable conversations I've ever had in my life, and one of the most incredible human beings. Yeah, he didn't need to be anyone but himself. Yeah, and I, that's a good lesson for the viewers watching. Um, is to, and that's why I want to have you on, man, because the results you've gotten from this challenge are crazy. And the people, the amount of calls you told me that you booked on the phone the other day were crazy. And it's just from you being yourself, man. Yeah. And that's all it is. And to the viewers watching, just start. Just start. And that's how you improve it is by just starting. The reason I did the 30-day <laughs> challenge was because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I find I have two options when I don't know. It's to hide until I figure it out. Or it's to go out into the world and try and fail until I figure it out. Yeah. One gives me real life experience. The other one makes sure I never fail and I never actually do anything. Part of me doing this 30 day challenge is every day I am testing out my pitch for my workshop. Mm -hmm. Every day I am making a new video where I'm, I'm, I'm talking about what I'm doing and what I'm selling and what I'm doing. And this is a really important part. If you're going to do, a, if you're going to sell, just sell. Just fucking sell. Yeah. Be direct and be honest about it. I I studied a bunch of 30-day challenges that were about hitting financial goals. They were like, hey, I'm going to try and hit $10,000 in a month. I'm going to hit whatever. All the ones that failed were the ones 
that it wasn't until like the last week that they actually said what they were selling. They actually like they were hiding, playing this weird game of indirectly mm. selling, indirectly saying, "Hey, I'm trying to make this money. Follow along for the journey." Uh, oh man, I I got a new client. I got a new thing. Yeah. But you're like, how the hell are you doing? What's the client? What's the thing? Yeah. Why I don't Why don't I know how to how to buy from you? You're not selling. Yeah. The reason I've had success is because the first week, I literally just said, "Hey, I'm gonna use AI <laughs> to make a hundred thousand dollars in thirty days." Yeah. I have this map methodology. I have this one day workshop. I'm gonna use AI and I'm gonna run it through ChatGPT. I'm gonna figure out how to pitch this. Here's a bunch of different variations. I'm saying them. I'm sharing them. And you're being real. And I'm being real, showing yeah. that, like, I don't know. I just know, I know how to integrate AI really well. I know, like, my one expertise. I don't know how to sell. I don't know how to make content well, even being in the space for, like, over a year. Yeah. Even having, like, hundreds of thousands of followers. I don't know how to do any of it well. I know my one thing that I'm confident about, AI. Everything else, I let people know that I make mistakes, <laughs> and I love that because there's no bullshit. It's like you're you're just being real and you're telling them straight up. Yeah, and people respect that, and I feel like that almost makes them want to work with you. I'm on the second week now of the challenge, and the whole I started the week with having the entire week lined up with sales calls, mm -hmm. and like my like two videos ago was a video where I literally just said, Jesus Christ, I'm being an idiot. I'm trying to achieve my goal. I'm trying to do this challenge by selling to complete strangers. I haven't asked or told any of my friends for a referral. Like, can you give me a referral? Like the people who are most likely to actually make sure that I, who want to yeah. see me succeed, who are most likely to trust me and pay me to do the things that like I know how to do. Mm -hmm. I was avoiding it. I just made a video saying, hey, guys, like, <laughs> I, I'm realized I'm focused on the money. I'm realized I'm focused on this. But, like, the number of $100,000 is just the number of, like, the value that I'm actually trying to give, mm -hmm. right? Like, I'm literally just trying to help people. Yeah. I I use the $100,000 as a hook for for the content. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. What matters is that I help that many people. Yeah, and that I love that. The value that they get, it feels like it's worth that much mm -hmm. money to them. Saying that to my friends, like, hey, I'd like your help. And then me saying, hey, I believe in what I do so much that, like, one, because you're helping me, I'm going to, any referral that you give me, I'm going to give you a little surprise. <laughs> Yeah. So any referral that people give me, I'm going to make a giant and print them out, a giant AI portrait of them looking <laughs> like a king or a queen, <laughs> like if they want it for their wife or whatever, oh, yeah. uh, as a fun little gift. But because they're putting their reputation on the line, giving, sending me a referral or recommendation, right, right. I switch my policy of unconditional guarantee if they're not happy for any reason, 100% money back. No questions asked. Because I want to protect them and make it as easy as possible for them to help me. And also you're just doing it to help people. Yeah. And that, that really shows. And The fact and that you're willing like, to do that shows. And the fact that, that just shows people that I believe in what I'm doing. Like, yeah, that too. If, if you generally don't find value from it, from the map, from the 90 day plan, like I... I literally have all the basics covered. Whether you choose to move forward with AI or not, you're going to be in a such a golden opportunity because it's usually doing these workshops is usually the first time people realize what their coworkers do. It's the first time they feel connected to the business, to the organization, the way first time they notice how what they do affects other people. Mm -hmm. It's the first time that they get to give their opinion they get to give 
they're asked for their opinion. They get mm-hmm. to talk about what hurts and what sucks yeah, in their felt job. Hurt. They feel, you know, heard. Yeah, they feel heard too and cared for. And it just, it's different, man, when... I see it. Yeah. When, when people who, like, having a team looking at your process, I can't tell you how many people do stuff just because it's the way they were told to do it. Yeah. Not because it's the best way to do it. Not because it's the right way to do it, because it's just the way that it's been done. It's, we we sir, we go along doing our very best with the things we know, and we get so busy working in the job that we never work on the job. Just how like a business yeah. owner, we're told, hey, you have to work on the business, not in the business. Yes. It's usually like the f- doing these workshops, employees have told me this is the first time I've ever had a day to like improve the way I do my work that I do my job. <laughs> yeah. So if you guys are interested in sign up for the workshop, I'm going to have it in the description. Um, is there anywhere else where they can find you? Yeah. At, on any platform, they can just look up AI daddy and, uh, they'll find me the websites, AI daddy.io. Mm-hmm. And for the workshop, you would just add slash workshop to yeah. the domain but again it'll be in the description so yeah. uh, and you know his challenge will still be going on by the time this episode comes out so make sure you help out lucas and help him get to his goal of 100,000 <laughs> uh but yeah again i appreciate you coming on man it was a pleasure thank you man it was a lot of fun all right